Today I'll be discussing the attributes of God. Now obviously it's very difficult to fit God, all of God, into a 40-minute message. But with a topic like this, I, all week I just stood amazed as I just looked at every area of God as far as the way he deals with mankind and how he always stays true to himself. What you believe about God is the most important thing about you. Everything that you believe about God impacts you in every area of your life. Attitudes, priority, choices, destiny. How you believe in God will dictate everything that you understand about yourself, about sin, about salvation, eternity, everything. Every dealing that you have, it, it, you will see who God is. This morning, as we discuss some of God's attributes, we will be discussing some of the ones that make us feel uncomfortable. There are attributes that make us feel uncomfortable. But when you can see what makes us feel uncomfortable, you can see the beauty of the solution that God has given us. See, we've taken the cross and we've dwindled it down to emotional stability. That, that, that God can meet every need, that God can deal with these emotionally. But the cross of Jesus Christ saved us from God himself. You, we need to understand that. That God himself, who is holy, righteous, justifiably protects his own righteousness. We can see the beauty of Jesus Christ. It's like seeing a black mat of sin. You know, I've, I've used this illustration before. There was a, a jeweler that, that pulled out a diamond for a particular guy, and he set it on this glass cabinet. And when he looked at it, the, 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 the guy was like, there's no way I can give my wife this diamond. Look how small it is. So then he took out the black mat and put it down. And then he took that diamond and put it over, and over, over the black mat. And the diamond shined with radiance and beauty. That's what happens when you see yourself in the light of God's holiness, his righteousness. Jesus Christ becomes infinite value, not a mere accent piece to your already good life. My goal in this message, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto himself. That's the goal, that we lift God up, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and you will see your problems, those things that seem so huge, will fall by the wayside as you look into the glory of God Almighty. You see, man, God has made man in his image, but nowadays man has formed a God in his own image. And, and so when we look at situations that come upon our lives, we say, how would we handle this? How would I handle this? You know, God's love tends to want to, in, in the mind of, of us, override every attribute. That's why you have books that say love wins. Everyone's going to heaven. Universalism, everyone, no matter who you are, is going to heaven because love wins. But when you understand the attributes of God and you see them all in succession, in succinction of who God is, it's beautiful. Let's open up with, with uh, Romans chapter 1, verses 18 and 23. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, divine nature, have clearly been seen, being understood through what was made so that we are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations." And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God. Listen to this. For an image in the form of corruptible man. So we see that there is a wrong view of God. When you don't have the right view of God, all you have left is a futile 
speculation of who he is. I've heard this and said it many times. How could a loving God, how many of you have said that or heard that? How could a loving God, how could a loving God allow this to happen? You know, miscarriages, death of a loved one, sickness, suffering. Where do you see God's love in that? See, when you look at situations like that, you, you, you tend to try to put God's love. You, you, you can't figure out what's going on when something is happening to you that does not seem loving. Can I, can I help you with this today? When you don't understand something, put an attribute of God in that blank. Put a, an attribute of God in that blank. See, is your belief system man-centered or God-centered? Is it man-centered or God-centered? You will see, as we begin to discuss some of these things, you will be able to see how you view God. Let's look at some of the futile speculations. A glorified Santa Claus. He, he's larger than life, very marketable. He's omniscient, um, omnipresent. He lives in the north, surrounded by helpers. He has a list of who's naughty or nice. He visits to bring gifts, makes no demands. And his very existence is only to meet the needs of his followers. Then there's a divine co-pilot. He's positioned welcoming everyone on board. He's in standby mode in case something goes wrong. The pilot has all the responsibility and the co-pilot is there for the turbulence. The co-pilot is welcoming everyone on board and, and hoping to give them a safe flight. Then there's the heavenly repairman. Always willing to fix. He's a phone call away. If something's not broke, he's not needed. To view God in this only capacity is missing the very glory and power of God. Then the heavenly grandfather. Most grandpas are abundant in affection, uh, affection lacking in discipline and full of devotion. Their corrections go unmerited. They become empty threats. Grandpa can be won over by a simply batting of the eyes. When the grandkids misbehave, grandpa just understands. His feelings never get hurt. He doesn't get angry. The days of discipline have been used up on his own child. <laughs> Grandpas are like, I, I disciplined my kid. <laughs> And they, they know that God speaks about sin, but due to his long suffering, they think he is senile and does not mean what he says. <laughs> Some of you are like, I think that is me. <laughs> now let's look at the origin of the distortion. In the beginning of human history, Satan slithered into the garden and asked the first question recorded in Scripture. In Genesis 3 verse 1 said, did God actually say you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? With that one statement, Eve doubted God and it changed the picture of who he was. God would walk with them in the cool of the day. He revealed himself as provider, giving them everything that they needed in the garden. He displayed his, his character as judge, establishing a, a penalty for those that attacked his character. He, is, he put angels with flaming swords right there at the gate that they, they, whenever they kicked him out, that he was, they were not able to come in. See, his love and holiness go hand in hand. His love and holiness go hands in hand. Understand something. God is under no obligation to man. He is under no obligation to us whatsoever. But yet, his love was shown and what he did. You understand this? They had put themselves fig leaves. But God took an animal and put the skin of the animal around them. God could have said, I'm done. You blew it. Never mind. But he didn't. And then something, something happened. There was a sacrificial system, apparently, because Cain and Abel are ordering, are, are doing sacrifices. See, you see, God never created hell for man. He created it for the devil and his angels. 
But the book of Isaiah said it had to be enlarged. Now, if you think of this, God instituted relationship by creating them. Then they blew it. Then he established, bringing them back into existence, the fact that he wanted relationship by what he did, by clothing them and giving them a sacrifice, sacrificial system. Now, here's what Satan did. In, his, in, in, the, in the mind of Adam and Eve, they said God, he said, God is holding out on you. So it planted the seed of doubt. He, you, you've got him all wrong. You need to see him in a different light. How many times has Satan ever said that to us? If God were good, he would not allow this to happen to you. See, Satan came in and sprayed graffiti on the beautiful portrait of God. And in the wrong view of God, the first family carried out sin. But then you have the Pharisees who saw him as legalistic, a mean God. So you have a swing way on the other side. And all the while, God is saying, I'm here and I am me. Satan says the same thing today. Has God really said, has God really said the soul that sinneth shall surely die? Has God said, I am the way, the truth, and the life through Jesus Christ? Has he really said that? Do you mean to tell me if I do not accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I am condemned? That's exactly what the Bible says over and over and over again. The Lord is our God, and he changes not. But, but we're getting progressive. Isn't God getting progressive? God is eternal. He's already in the mindset of where we're going to be 50 years from now. He does not change who he is. But you see, once man creates a false speculation of who God is, the restraint is cast off. In Daniel 11.32, this is the value of knowing the true God. The people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. See, this is the starting point for corrective action in our own life. What is the most important thing on the face of this earth? Jeremiah tells us in Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Thus saith the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts, boast of this, that he understands and knows me. There's nothing greater but knowing God. Now, as we go into the attributes, I want to discuss some attributes with you that are normally misunderstood, but then I want to show you the life application that we receive due to how God is. Number one, God is self-sufficient, self-existing, and all-knowing. I'm going to, okay, let me slow down here. There's a lot of attributes of God, so I kind of tried to lump some of them in and keep some that needed more explanation. I mean, you could do a whole series on this, and I don't want to preach a whole series in one service. So I don't want anybody mad at me. <laughs> Psalms 50, verse 9 and 12. I shall take no young bull out of your house, nor male goats out of your fold. For every beast in the forest is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills, I know every bird of the mountains. Everything that moves on the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all that it contains. Listen, I'm going to read a couple of verses, and it will make us uncomfortable. But don't get nervous. The good news is coming. Listen, God needs nothing from man. He is self-sufficient. He is all-knowing. The grandeur that all we see in a fallen, sinful world that is still beautiful came out of the mind of God. Imagine what it looks like beyond the clouds. Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God. This tells us he was there before the beginning. We cannot figure this out. God had never had a starting point. He was always here. Now, he didn't create anything because he was lonely. He needed something to do. He didn't create anything. This is why he created Isaiah 43, 7. Bring all who claim me as their God, their God, for I made them for my glory. 
So you see in Acts 17, 24, and 25, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. You see, God doesn't need anything because this is what we do. We worship God. Something don't go in our right. Well, God, I'm not worshiping you then. Fine. Fine. God created us because it simply pleased him to do so. You see, he is seated high, self-sustaining, above every conflict. Yet when he sees you, he chooses to interject himself in the smallest turmoil and trouble. Why? Because he wants to show you, I am the great deliverer. I love you. I am all powerful. I can change that circumstance. See, many believe that they can supply God something. In himself, he's self-sufficient. Now, that seems arrogant or conceited. Not when you're perfect. When you're perfect, there's no such thing as arrogance. Everything you need is when you're looking in the mirror. Listen, God needs defending about as much as a lion does. All you have to do is let that lion out of his cage. But God is not caged. God is a lion, a powerful king that allows you to get close, that allows us to experience his love and mercy. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. His perfect knowledge sees every perception. All things are laid bare before him. In Psalms 139, 1 through 4, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit, when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. What's the best explanation of this? Mom. She knows the motive. She knows where you're going. (laughs) And yet she still loves you. She knows the motive by what's said. (laughs) She knows, I know you want to go over here because of this. And you're like, how did she know that? She's displaying the omniscience of God. She's she's just, it's just flowing down. God's saying, hey, you need this. See, we cannot hide our thought life. We can hide it from our wives, our husbands, our friends. But everything is laid bare before God. But there is never a problem that God cannot fix. He never has to learn. There is not an issue in your life or on this earth that God cannot deal with it perfectly because he is perfect. Isaiah 40, 13 through 14, who has understood the mind of the Lord? Who has instructed him as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? And who taught him the right way? Listen, is there anything you need? God will give you wisdom. I want to encourage you. When you get down before God on your knees, you are talking to the creator of the heavens and the earth, the king of kings and lord of lords. If you wanted to schedule a meeting with the president, you'd have all kind of red tape you'd have to go through. You'd have to pass through security. And then you would go into an office and they would say, we'll see what we can do. But with God... When you drop to your knees, you are talking to the king of kings, the judge of all the earth. You're talking to the one that can make waters appear in a desert. You are talking to the one that will split the sea and you will walk on dry ground. You are talking to the one that could calm the storms in your life. Amen. Praise God. So what's the life application here? There is no need that cannot be met. Because he's unlimited in all of his resources. He is secure. Nothing will catch him off guard. Nothing in your life will catch him off guard. He knows what we need before we ask him. You can take your past, present, and future and place it in God's hands. And he will hold it and secure it. His self-existence shows that he does not need to pull from a circumstance, all he has to do is pull from his self. There is no situation that God cannot completely change. God never has a bad day. If you need joy, God will give you joy. He can supply it because it simply comes from him. And this should keep us striving for more of God. 
Number two, God is holy, holy, holy. Now, if you look in Isaiah, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. You see this same song being sung in the book of Revelation. That's eternal. That's going on. Now, why are they not saying loving, loving, loving? That's what we want. It's like, let me find a Bible that says, instead of holy, loving. Holiness is power. It's separation. It's untainability. Meaning God cannot be tainted because of his holiness. Listen, it's the essence of all that he is. God declared war on evil. Not because people did something wrong, because unholiness was there, and he is holy. The very existence of evil is, is why God is moved to action. And when you understand the holiness of God, it's understandable that he would banish it from his, his view. See, God is completely separate. There's no stain in him. He has never done anything wrong. He has never misjudged, and he never will. He is like a beautiful, flawless diamond that is beyond comprehension. If these clouds were to roll back, we would see such grandeur and beauty, and we would hear voice of thunder and mighty rushing water. We would see the architect of the ages as he created everything in gold and precious jewels. We would see angels all around him. You would see people bowing before him. Come on, you need to get that view of God. Instead of a situation comes up, oh, I just don't know if God can deal with it. God is all powerful. There is nothing he cannot do. Nothing. You name it, he can conquer it. Thank you, Jesus. With the blast of his nostrils. It splits the cedars of Lebanon, the Bible says. You ever seen a cedar? It's huge. God holds the seven seas in the palms of his hand. He weighs the mountains in a balance. Are you getting this great picture of God? Our God is perfect. Our God reigns. Our God is ours. We get to behold his majesty. Matthew 5, 48 says, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Now that throws the big monkey wrench. Or, you know, the record. David asked, who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Do you see that this brings a problem, a chasm? Man on his best day is imperfect. If you were to stay in bed all day, it would still be imperfection because it's not by the things we do. It's by our separation from God. It's, it's, it's the fact that if we don't have Jesus Christ, that God is separate from us, still wooing us. Exodus 34, 7, he will by no means clear the guilty. So see, his holiness demands judgment. Once again, problem. But it's the grace of God that he associates with mankind. David said, would or man that you are mindful of him. When David saw God and thought of him, he, he thought of himself and said, oh, man, we got a problem. One fruit was enough to kick the first family out of the garden. Look at Satan in Isaiah 14, 14. I will make myself like the most high God. One act of pride was enough to kick him out of heaven. Think of that. What is that one thing, that one thing that, that we hold on to? That's enough. That one thing is enough for a holy God. See, this is the same lie that's going on today. I will be like the most high God. You have people walking around. My truth is my truth. Right? You hear that all the time. Boy, brother, that's just my truth. I wish I'd have had that foolishness when I was in school. Because in math, I didn't do very good. I would say, you know what? Two plus two equals four is your truth. How dare you make me question what I think? I believe that. <laughs> I would say, hey, this is my truth. And you cannot condemn me on my truth. That only works with, with religion. That, that's where it works. <laughs> the same cry is for man today. I, I live by my rules. 
I believe what I believe. This is what I believe God is. Can you imagine? Look, let's go into the book with, with Moses. Moses was walking by. He saw the glory of God burning a bush. And he hid his face on the ground in fear, knowing that God's holiness was there. When God shows up on the scene, that place is sanctified, holy. It wasn't his love that did that. It was the fear and reverence. You see, God loved Moses. But it was when you see God as holy, it brings that. It brings that belief. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Moses attends a meeting with God. God tells the, you know, the, the budget and finance committee, don't touch the mountain. <laughs> Wasn't really a budget and finance committee. That's a, you know, church joke. <laughs> but anyway, he, he told them, don't even touch the mountain. There were some people that, that disagreed with God. God opened the ground and swallowed them. Do you see holiness? Holiness and power. When we see the true revelation of God's holiness, we will be like Peter who says, depart from me, Lord. For I am a sinful man. This is the only response to the revelation of his holiness. But that should bring security because God is sovereign. He is holy. That means he cannot be turned against you. He cannot, he cannot be, you know, if he, if he, if he had a, a hint of evil, then Satan could come and make him turn his mind on you. But he does not do that. Psalms 115.3 says, our God is in heaven and he does all that he pleases. I like that. Isaiah 46, 9 and 11, for I alone am God and there is none like me. Only I can tell you the future before it happens. Everything I plan will come to pass. I do whatever I wish. I will call a swift bird from the prey of the east, a leader from a distant land to come up and do my bidding. I have said what I would do and I will do it. See, God's not worried about Iran's nuclear enrichment program. God's not concerned. He's not worried. But here's the life application. What has God promised you? Hell or high water, that thing will happen in your life. Even if we get involved and mess it up, the Bible says that he will work all things out for your good and for his glory. Praise God. But listen, we only use sovereignty in the context of suffering. When something happens, well, you know, brother, God is sovereign. Let's look at sovereignty when he spared you from a wreck, when you forgot your, your, your wallet or your purse at home. That's still sovereignty. See we, see, we see all these things going on in the world, and we act as if God is an innocent bystander. Like he's losing sleep or he gets nervous. He calls an emergency meeting with the Godhead. God doesn't do that. He knows everything. Look at Cyrus. He was the evil ruler of Persia. And God referred to him as my shepherd, I will, who will perform all my desire. Look at that. He used Pharaoh, the most powerful monarch on the face of the earth at that time. And God dwindled him down to fish bait for his glory. God is never reacting from lemonades given to man to make lim uh, lemons to make lemonade. Look, Joseph, all of what Joseph went through, God said, I see that, I'm using that, and I will raise you up in power. Do you see how glorious God is? He, he tells the sun how hot to get. He tells the ocean how far to come. He tells the mountains how high they can go. He tells the tree how high it can go. But then he looks at man and says, come, and we say, no, no. That shows you anybody that has a problem with God does not understand God. If you, if you love God, if you understand God, how can you not love God? What's inconceivable is that he loves us. God is perfect. How could you not love perfection? In Job, he's in control of the weather. In Job 37, says, my heart pounds as I think of this. It trembles within me. I'm going to drop down to, to verse 4. Then comes the roaring of the thunder, the tremendous voice of his majesty. He does not restrain it when he speaks. God's voice is glorious in the thunder. 
We can't even imagine, imagine the greatness of his power. He directs the snow to fall on the earth and tells the rain to pour down. Then everyone stops working so they can watch his power. Except for Canturi. I mean, he kind of goes out and... <laughs> I thought of that when I was reading. I was like, some people go out in the midst of it. All right, let's keep going. The wild animals take cover inside their dens. The stormy wind comes from its chamber, and the driving winds bring cold. God breathes and sends the ice, freezing, freezing wide expanses of the water. He loads the cloud with moisture and flashes in lightning. The clouds churn about his direction. They do whatever he commands through the earth. Then you read this last verse. He makes these things happen to either punish or to show his unfailing love. But listen, a hurricane in a desert is not a bad thing. See, the Bible is not silent on who God is. The Bible is not silent. We see that with Noah, God said, I will send the rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. I will blot from the face I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I have made. It was God who unlocked the deep. It was God who sent the rain. Listen, God is sovereign. Listen, my dad went get his test results. And they got to put him back on the, on the, 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 the big chemo. I didn't like that. That's not a good, you know. But listen, his sovereignty. I told my dad, dad, what you have is a jewel. Because the glory of God is displayed. When my dad gets up to sing a song about God sustaining you in suffering, there's not a dry eye in the place. When I think of Lorena and I think of walking into that, service, that, that, uh, that room and you could feel God's presence in there sustaining her as she is lifting her brittle hands to worship God as she was between heaven and earth. That is all powerful. You don't say, oh, wow, look how awesome Lorena is. Oh, wow, look how awesome Larry is. You say, look how awesome God is. But God was also with Paul in the many afflictions that he went through. And look how you are blessed today with that. God is sovereign over Satan and his forces. You see, God has Satan on a leash. And he can only go as far. And sometimes, if you're good, God will allow you to hold that leash. And the very one that is tormenting you, you don't, even re- you don't even realize that you have power over him through the cross of Jesus Christ. He becomes like a little garden snake. You see, at the cross, Satan was humiliated. His claws were ripped out. His teeth were ripped out. He's nothing but a shadow. But a shadow of a beast cannot harm you. A shadow of a beast cannot harm you. Satan right now is awaiting the judgment of God. He's doing whatever he wants to do, and God is still up in heaven watching. But he has given you his power. God didn't have to do that, but he did it. Number three, and I'm sorry, let's look at the life application. He's so far above evil, yet he is involved with us. He is perfect. Everything that he does, he, he can be trusted. He can be trusted in everything, in every aspect of creation. In all circumstances, God is in control and over. Number three, God's wrath. Proverbs 16, 6, by the loving kindness, truth, truth, iniquity, by loving kindness and truth, iniquity is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one keeps away from evil. You see, this is something that I really do understand because the reverence and in, in, in godly fear that I have, you know, if you just walk in love, everything's love, then I'll, you know, just giving you my personal testimony, I trampled that. Because love, okay, well, God loves me. I can do whatever I want. God's love to the sinner is a blank check. It's a blank check to do whatever he wants to do. But when you see that God's wrath and, ho- and holiness is there, it makes me look at Jesus and say, oh, that's why you took my place. We don't want to look at that. We think like it, it smudges God's perfect portrait. It was smudged by the original thought process 
towards God. We read earlier, his wrath is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Now, if you think of that, that's the, the, the bad news. The good news is we have Jesus. We have Jesus. See, this seems to be a contradiction, his wrath and love, but they go hand in hand. They complement each other better than any attribute with God. This is not an, we don't have to apologize for this attribute. Because those wrath, that wrath is pointed at the enemies of God. Demonic forces are the enemies of God. Satan is an enemy of God. His, his wrath is our protection. See, when you look in Romans eleven twenty two, 22, it says it perfectly. Note that the kindness and severity of our God. Nahum, chapter 1, 2, 3, and 7 says, The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger. I love this part, and you will too. The Lord is slow to anger, great in power. The Lord will by no means clear the guilty. The Lord is good. It's like, whew, get to that part. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows those who takes refuge in him. Are you in his refuge? Only you can answer that. See, notice the Bible doesn't say he has these things. He is these things. Where do you think we've got our attributes from? But we're just imperfect. We, man, we will shoot wrath at, on Ambassador Caffrey. <laughs> or Admiral Dahl, if you're from New Iberia. But I feel like this could work in a society nowadays. I really do. I feel like, like you know, people, brother, that's just you. You got to be true to you. you what, if that's how you are, you walk, be happy in that, sister. Well, that's what God is doing. He is who he is. And we're like, oh, God, you shouldn't be that way. You see, he's full of wrath and fury, but at the same time, full of love, mercy, grace, goodness. Why does he not pour it out on us? He tells us in Isaiah 48, 9 and 11, for my own sake, I will honor my name. I will hold back my anger and not wipe you out. I will rescue you for my sake. Yes, for my own sake. I will not let my reputation be tarnished. See, God's reputation for his own glory is a great motivation. I don't want it on me. I don't want God motivated to love because of me. I can be unloving. You can ask my wife. But when God says, the greatest thing that I can do is love you in spite of you because I am love. Come on, you don't create babies so they can one day get older and cut the grass for you. Maybe some do. But you create them because like, you want to love them. You want to shower them. You want to train them. You want to see what they look like. You want to equip them. You, all of these reasons, that's the same reason God did. Because he loves us. He, God is saying, I am so powerful, so mighty, so beautiful. I'm going to create you and, and show you everything that I have. I'm going to show you everything. I'm going to, the best thing that God can give us is himself. When God looks at us, the Bible says to make his face shine upon us, that's God looking. When God moves his face from people, that's his wrath. That's the best way to look at it. Now listen, there's ca catastrophic wrath. You read that, you can see that in Genesis with the flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, the plagues in Egypt. But the righteous were spared. See, this is perfectly understood in modern day court. If a man is guilty, the judge is on the bench. Everyone in the room knows he's guilty. The, the jurors know he's guilty. The family knows he's guilty. And the judge says, I'm going to let you off because I'm a loving judge. You would, you would write in the paper about this guy. You would, you would be furious. He would be an imperfect judge. But God is not imperfect, so therefore he must judge. And condemn all of evil. If, if not, he would be an accomplice to evil. And he would have to dethrone himself. Abandoning wrath. In Proverbs 1, 24 and 33. Because I have called, you refuse to listen. I stretched out my hand and, and no one has heeded. I'm going to skip down to verse 29. 
You can read that, the, 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 uh, the other verses. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord and would have none of my counsel and despised all of my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their way. See? And have their feel of their own devices. Whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. Then there's consequential wrath, which is sowing and reaping. And then there's this, Romans 12, 19. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. Vengeance is mine. I will repay the Lord. Listen, when someone does evil against you, as hard as it is, you forgive while God deals with it. That is the best thing you can do. Listen, God, through Jesus Christ, Jesus drank the full cup of wrath that we deserved, y'all. We deserved that. Some of you may be saying, I, I don't do that. Yes, you do. We all do. But Jesus took that upon himself. Our holiness is hidden in the wounds of Christ. Just as Moses was hid in the cleft of the rock when his glory passed by. That's Jesus. And then number four, God's love, goodness, grace, joy, glory, forgiveness, and mercy. All the ones that we love. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 9, and 10, By this love, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for sin. So how do you wrap this up? Listen, the wisdom of God devised a way for the love of God to deliver, deliver sinners from the wrath of God while not compromising the righteousness of God. That's how you see it. It's, it's the perfect picture. Listen, uh, uh, if, uh, uh, washing dishes, and I, I heard this said, washing dishes, you do not go up to the washing machine and clap your hands for the washing of the dishes by a machine. But when your little son or daughter or your husband goes and wash the dishes, you applaud that. See, us, <laughs> take note, <laughs> So if you look at it in, in, in the context, God could have said, think this way, do this, do that. But he would get no glory in that, no love. The fact that Jesus took everything that I deserved upon himself, that is what draws me to him. You see, if you look at a washing machine, that's what it does. If we were a bunch of robots, we'd have no re our glorifying of God would be like, it's expected. But the fact that he saved me from drugs and alcohol and immorality and all of these things, and, and God could have destroyed me. He could have stoned me to death from heaven, from his throne room, over the balcony. All God would have had to do was just, that's you, Kelly. And I'd have been dead. But he chose not to do that. He chose not to do that. Listen. Why bring up good and mercy and love now? Chemotherapy is of no value unless you know you have cancer. If you think about it. If you look at the sickness that is in this world of sin, if, we, if, if God is love, God is love, God is love, then we'll, this is what people say. I, well, I love me, and if God loves me, dude, this is going to work perfectly. God has plans for me. I have plans for me. This is going to be a match made in heaven. But when we realize that we deserved everything that we just spoke about, and yet Jesus Christ took all of that, 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 that makes me want to worship God even right now. See, the cross is more than just defeating depression, anxiety, worry, problems. It's, it's absolving condemnation. While we were yet sinners, while we were at war with God, Christ died. Goodness gives me what I don't deserve, and his mercy spares me from what I do. There is no greater picture 
of his goodness than in forgiveness. Psalms 86.5, the Lord, Lord, you are good and ready to forgive. Ready to forgive. Do you feel like you are at war with God? Wave that white flag and say, Lord, I am sorry. I repent. I lay it down before you. I lay my gun down. I wave the white flag. And God says, I am ready to forgive you. I am ready to give you all of heaven. I am ready to empower you, to love you. I am ready to wrap my big burly arms around you and comfort you in your time of need and affliction. That's the God that we serve. That should be a freeing thought. God's ultimate glory is seen in saving evil sinners and showering showering us with love and still keeping his righteousness. Listen, his love for you is perfect, which means it won't increase and it won't decrease. You can do a bunch of things. God will love you the same. You cannot do some things and God will love you the same because his love for you is perfect. See, you did not go to God. We, we think like, oh, man, you know, I, I think I'm ready to get, to, to get with God. I, I think I'm ready to do this. God had been pursuing you. You were dead in your sin. Dead, no ears, no eyes, nothing. God had been wooing you, and then he finally conquered our proud, rebellious heart. And he said, I am going to show you. Look at Hosea. That was God's idea. Gomer had, was sitting on this auction block of sin. She had went to him and went back to the world, went back to the streets. And Hosea went and said, I will take you. I will pay for you. That's a picture of Jesus. Those many times that you came to him and backslid, went back into the world, went back your own way, was mad, frustrated. Jesus was there watching you. And when you got on that auction block again, and all of these immoralities were buying for you and telling you, you're mine, I'm going to get you back. I'm going to hold on to you. Jesus said, I am paying for you. I am here to redeem you in your rebelliousness, in your sinfulness, because I am God and there is none like me. That's freeing. Romans 2.4, don't you see how wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing? Can't you see the kindness is intended to turn you from sin? Now, as we, as we finish this up, Psalms 31, 19, oh, how abundant is your goodness. How abundant for those who fear you and, and, and work for those who take refuge in you. Listen, the cross of Jesus Christ, at that moment, all of God's attributes were clearly seen. His wrath was poured out. His reputation, his righteousness was seen. His glory, his provision, his judgment, his anger towards sin, his justification, his holiness, his mercy towards man. All of that was seen at one moment. The Bible says that it pleased God to crush him. Why? Not because he wants to punish people, because he saw that Jesus Christ, through him, we could come to him. His sin, the sin was dealt with. Remember, God hates sin. He doesn't say, oh, don't, I don't want to see that. God's looking at sin and he's like, I will crush you. I will crush you. But instead, he crushed his son. And in that, when we walk in Jesus, we don't have to experience wrath, judgment, all of these things. That's where we get joy, mercy, goodness, power, love, oh, long-suffering, all of these things. Why? Because he was The sin had been dealt with. So now we can walk into freedom. Do you see how awesome salvation is? Listen, when Jesus died on Calvary, the the Bible says that the veil was ripped from the top to the bottom. Why? There's a Jewish tradition. You remember when uh, Jacob saw the, the coat of Joseph that was full of blood? He ripped his coat, showing emotion and disgust. When, when, when the veil was torn, it was the holy of holies, God was saying, I'm broken for my son, but come in. I love you. It was his acceptance. So you, under, you have to understand this. If, if you don't want Jesus, 
you get these attributes of wrath, judgment, all of these things. But if you run to Jesus, run to Jesus, you get all the love, mercy, grace, everything. All outside of Christ are unworthy. All who are in Christ are made worthy. Can we stand? Now, there may be some of you here that may not know the Lord. You have never entered into a relationship with the Lord. I just want to give you three things. How do you do this? Number one, you, ha- you desire to be right with God, which means you understand his holiness, his reverent fear. Listen, this is a must in, in going into a relationship with God. It's like the, the book of Isaiah. Isaiah, he, he, when he saw God, he said that he was a man of unclean lips and he dwells in the midst of people that are unclean. When you get a revelation of who God is, you will see yourself as unable to please God. You will see others around you. It will make you want to evangelize because you say, man, if I'm like this, look at these people. <laughs> that's not like, oh, I'm not as bad as these people. I know that's how you took it, though. <laughs> but in look, in Luke, it says, I tell you, friends, do not fear those who can kill the body. After leaving, after that, nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you to whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has the authority to cast into hell. Listen, in Hebrews, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? God has given us a choice. He has given us a choice. Number two, trust. That means you trust. You trust in your inability and trust in his ability. The Bible says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So you acknowledge that, okay, I I have sinned, I have fallen short. And you know, yes, I know God is perfect. I cannot do anything. I cannot save myself. So you throw yourself at the feet of Jesus and you begin to thank him and say, Lord, I trust all that you are because I know all that I am. I lay it down at your feet. And God, I ask you to cleanse me and wash me. I ask you to cleanse me and wash me. And in Psalms, number three, thanks. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless his holy name, who forgives all of my iniquity and heals all of my diseases, who redeems me from the pit. Think of that. You have forgiveness available to you. In Psalms, he does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love towards those who fear him. From the, as far as the east is from the west, he will cast our sin. You don't have to be defeated. You don't have to feel like maybe God is not loving me. No, the Bible says a father shows compassion to his children. The Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Walk in Christ. Let me see your hand if you have never made that decision. This is the greatest decision that you will ever make. Maybe you can say that I have trampled the blood of Jesus, that I have not looked at what I deserved, but yet now I see it. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for us as a congregation that we would always keep our mind on the holiness and the reverence of God, that he is all powerful, that he is all knowing, that God has plans for you as an individual. He has plans for this church. He has plans for your family. God doesn't want any of your family to die and go to hell. He doesn't want any of your friends, even more than you don't want it, because he is almighty, all-powerful. So, Father, I just come right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I, I ask that every person that is here, God, that you would make your face to shine upon them, God. That God, that you would bless their coming and that you would bless their going. God, that you would relight that fire on the inside of them, God, to, to, to minister, Lord, to your people, to minister, Lord, to, to people that are already serving you, but that are maybe trying to backslide, Lord. Father, I lift the ones up to you, Lord, that their family is, their hearts are hard as rock, very religious, traditional. We come against that in the name of Jesus. And Father, we ask for your love, your mercy, your grace to invade that stony heart, God, and make it a heart of flesh, pliable in the King of kings and Lord of lords' hands. So Father, we thank you for meeting with us today. God, we thank you for blessing us with your presence. 
in Jesus' name, the most matchless, powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Let's give him a hand clap of praise. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord.